Yeah, so we'll, we'll do some cleanup, uh, some some uh, points that we ha that I'd like to talk about, and then we'll briefly summarize uh, what, what we hopefully some of the lessons of the past 18 classes that we that I've, I've talked to you about. So one is a question that I've thought about for, for a long, long time, and um, a couple of years ago, Francis Crick and I had some so concrete suggestions, so we put these two paper and written uh, two papers on this. Um, until the age probably of 30, I always thought, A, I strenuously denied, I remember having debates with some friends, the existence, the true existence of the unconscious in the Freudian sense, in the sense that, that there are large parts of my brain, of my mind, that are inaccessible to me and that, that sort of make me do things that I'm not aware of. You know, in, in the Freudian sense, in a sense not, you know, not sensory motor, not l l t talking language or not sort of low-level vision, but in the, in the sense that, you know, important decisions, why I have friends, why I choose certain friends, why I choose certain subjects, why I choose to behave in a certain way, not in different ways, that I just felt the notion was, you know, was ridiculous that there was something in my head that I didn't know of and that it was influencing my behavior. But as you get older, you learn and you realize that that's actually, to a, certain, to a very large extent, that's actually true, whether you like it or not, that there that to a large extent your behavior um, is determined by, um, by, um, by uh, decision rules that are inaccessible to you. And so therefore the adage of Western philosophy, know thyself, and it's actually indeed very difficult to know thyself. And you can just strive to do that throughout your entire life. Um, but uh, so there's a related question. If you think in terms of a computational architecture, and you look at the computational architecture of the brain and the, and the mind, and you, where do you situate consciousness? You know, so at the input level, you have, your, um, you have your sensors, you have your retina and your cochlea. And then at the next stage, you have sort of low-level visual routines or low-level, you know, sensory routines, you know, that deal with face recognition, that deal, you know, with all the other, you know, letter, um, word recognition, all the other things that we can do so effortlessly and so well. And then so somewhere in the, in the more central part, and then, of course, on the output side, you have, you know, at this low level, you have your output effector that just, you know, make, me, make you move at the more complex, at the somewhat higher level, you have things that can execute entire sequences of behavior, or that can put a single behavior, that can trigger entire behavior, not just a single motor action, or that can trigger sort of entire sequence of behaviors, like, you know, if you dance or climb or do anything like that. But then, you ha then the question is, where, where in this processing hierarchy do you situate consciousness? Now, certainly when I was naive, I, th I thought about it in the following way, and I think most people do, that if you ask them, most people would assume that consciousness sort of is at the pinnacle of the processing pyramid, right? So if you have this processing pyramid where you start at the input, and then you go to high stages, and then you descend again to go to the output, that most people believe that, of course, what I'm conscious of is sort of, is the most elaborate part of, in, elaborate in terms of information processing, is the most elaborate part of my brain. It's the highest level of brain that I'm, that this is really where consciousness resides. That's where it must have access to, to the highest level of, um, of information processing. Uh, and I think that's wrong. And uh, quite a number of people have developed elaborate theories based on, these are called intermediate level theories of consciousness. That the idea is that you, you do not have access, that consciousness does not have access to the outermost stages of processing. For example, in the retina, we talked about it many times, that what's in the retina is necessary for seeing, but it's not really, the character of retinal firing is really very different from the character of the way I see. But you also don't have access to your innermost um, parts of your mind. In fact, these theories, particularly are famous cognitive scientist called Jackendorf at Brandeis, he argues that what you think of your thoughts, that your thoughts are really unconscious, and what you're seeing, what you're conscious of is a reflection of, your, of it's a mapping of your thoughts into sensory dimensions, into um, image, silent speech, or into imagery. So the claim is that, all, that what you really are aware of is almost always sensory information that you're aware of, either the sensory information that comes from the outside or sensory information that comes from the inside, sort of when you close your eyes or you daydream or you're imagining things or you're thinking or you're reasoning. The claim is that or what you're reasoning and you're, what you're thinking is always in pictures. It's either in, sorry, it's always in sensory quality. So it's either in pictures or it's in, in silent speech um, or maybe it's, you know, in tactile, although that's very rare, but it's not, but you, you don't really have access to, to, to the thoughts themselves, that they are hidden from conscious, from direct conscious introspection. Yeah, so this is this, um, this uh, um, Ray Jackendorf? No. 
in the first name. So, like, so he's a cognitive scientist, and he has written an, a substantial book, which is quite well known in the cognitive science community, in the cognitive community, uh, consciousness and the computational mind, where he analyzes particular music and he analyzes high-level vision, not at the low level, but the, at the high level, but particular music and language, and where he argues that this is um, this is what we're really aware of. We are aware of a representation of the outer world. So we are aware of, you know, representation of, of the visual world and of the tactile world and of the auditory world, certain aspects of the world. Of course, we're not, it's a point that Kant made, you know, very emphatically in the critique of pure reason. We, of course, n never conscious of the world itself, right? We don't have direct access to the world itself. We only have access to the world indirectly through our representations. So famously, he called this das Ding an sich. It's a very famous term in, in philosophy, the thing in itself, which is the one that um, das Ding... Das, das Ding jetzt means the thing, das Ding an sich, Ding an sich, thing in itself. Um, that means um, we 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 have, we we can only uh, we can only observe appearances, and as they are filtered through our senses, as they are filtered through our categories of conceptual understanding, the most important being uh, causality and space and time. So, you know, he has this elaborate argument over 600 pages, very dense prose that I don't understand, so I prefer to read it in modern English than in, in German because it's really impenetrable. But that, uh, where, where, where he does argue that, that, um, that we have these categories of, of, um, of, of, um, of representation and the, the most important ones, like I said, causality and time and space and everything, we have to situate everything in a particular point in time and we have to situate everything in a particular point in space and everything has to have a, uh, has to have a prior ca cause. These are all the phenomena, all the phenomena in the world, phenomena, have to have these uh, in these categories, but the thing in itself, uh, the nomina, we, we can never really have access. And so we, we can certainly appreciate that in um, in if you look at neuroscience, because we as you know as, as we said, we don't have access. Conscious representation don't occur in, in the retina. We Crick and I think they, they don't even occur in V1, but occur in higher in higher parts of the brain. So for sure, we don't have access to them. We have only access. In, we have only, the only way we have access to the world is through our, through our representations in our head. So it's really very, it's, it seems like a trivial or very deep point, depending on your point of view, but it's, it seems to be an unavoidable conclusion that we don't have access to the things outside. But, with, but on the other hand, so what we do, we have to do these correlational measurements, right? So we, we look at things, we touch them, we feel them, we smell them, we have experience from them, we have expectation. We know, you know, this is certain heaven, I would be surprised. And of course, you can fool me, you know, and, and we have all have these very powerful expectations of the world. And if they're not met, then we, you know, we are immediately surprised that we stumble if we miscounted a step or if something is lighter or it's heavier than, than we thought it is. And of course, that's where science comes in. That's where science is, you know, we measure things with, you know, across a spectrum, we, you know, we observe and measure and correlate things and then we try to find consistency. But it's, it's so we can approximate, the, we can approximate the nature of things to a, a higher and higher extent, but the fact is that we, it's approximation and we don't have direct access to them. So the, 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 I think, I mean, most people will accept that, although some, there's still these residual debates that I don't quite understand about do we really have access, don't we in some way have access to the thing itself? Is it out there in, in, in my head? It's just another book I was asked to review by some Gestalt psychologists that, have, that, that bring this argument to an incredible arcane level and I, I just don't really understand what the point is. I mean, clearly the world isn't inside, I mean, it's not inside my head. The representation of, of my world is inside my head, but the representation of the world outside is actually outside. Anyhow, I mean, that seems trivial to me, but... Um, this point, so th this point is the, in, is the sort of more interesting one that, and it's, it's difficult to, it's much more difficult to establish this using rigorous, at this point, using um, rigorous sort of scientific criteria, that, the, that we only have an, uh, that we don't really have access to our innermost world, that there's an inner, that there's an inner world that's uh, hidden from us um, by the design of our brains, just because, probably because for the function of consciousness, whatever the function of consciousness is, like to do planning, etc., doesn't require us to have access to these uh, de decision-making stages. And, and we don't have access to them, we only have an access to them as the output of these stages are reflected back onto the sensory surfaces, back onto visual cortex, back onto auditory cortex. And that's the only thing that, uh, that we have access to. So this school of thought would argue that we don't, that thoughts are really 
are really the, uh, the representations in the innermost world, we don't have access to them directly. We have only access to the reflections of the thoughts as they get reflected back onto our sensory surfaces. So that's the third conclusion, that these are expressed solely in sensory terms. That any, that any, uh, that really anything you feel is, that anything you, in your conscious mind is always expressed in terms of sensory terms. Including these funny things like, you know, you know, there are all these funny things like tip of the tongue, like deja vu, like, um, uh, you know, feeling of familiarity. There are all these, these funny, sort of, some people call them feelings, uh, sensations that are much, that are uh, very little studied, uh, mainly by psychologists, very difficult to study deja vu in, in a monkey. Um, although, you know, why shouldn't a monkey ha have the same feeling? Um, that, that these are also always expressed in, um, in sensory terms. I think it's most obvious in, um, for visual representations. So this is actually the picture which I find strangely very, very compelling. This is uh, from Jack and Stoff's book. And um, I find this very, well, so, they claim, so this is the outside world, everything outside in the universe, outside your brain. Well, of course, th your brain, I mean, your, your body is also a part of the outside world. And uh, then you have these very sensory processing modalities, right, visual cortex, auditory cortex, olfactory cortex, etc. And then they get processed, and then at some point they get representation. He's totally neutral. I mean, he doesn't know anything about the brain. He doesn't say anything about the brain. Um, but, you know, we would say, well, this somewhere happens here, you know, you know, higher, I mean, I would say it's not V1, other people would say it's V1, but somewhere here this happens, somewhere in visual cortex you have, you have the conscious representation that you, that, that actually generate the NCC, that generate your conscious perception. But then sort of you have this entire, and it's, uh, of course, this is schematized, we don't know what fraction of the brain is encompassed by this, the, our inner thoughts, our inner world, probably this includes much, much of the frontal globe, probably most of the prefrontal cortex, where, where we, don't, we don't know at, at, at this point to what extent neurons in prefrontal cortex actually directly correlate with consciousness. The best explored case is a visual case, and those are neurons in the high-level visual part or in the medial temporal lobe. Uh, we don't know yet about prefrontal cortex. But this would say there are large parts of prefrontal cortex that are inaccessible to us. They're very important for, for, for you know, planning and decision making, etc. But we don't really, we, we're not really conscious of them. What we're conscious of, whatever arises here, whatever um, thoughts or concepts and neural activity uh, is arisen here, then gets reflected or partially reflected back onto this surface, this inner surface, the sensory surface, and this is where consciousness happens. So, you know, consciousness would be this, I mean, conceptually would be this, this shell there's this entire world outside, and then there's this world inside, and the only thing you are, I mean, what your consciousness is, what you are in one sense, you and your person, and your memory, and your thoughts, and your selfhood, and your personality, sort of would be this sort of this conceptually, this shell, this shell intercalated between the inner world and the outer world. I find it very, very, very compelling. I beg your pardon? No, he does not talk about emotion. He talks about language, he talks about uh, music, both which I know nothing, and he talks a little bit about vision. I'll, I'll, I'll come to vision. No, I don't know, um, I don't know where, where emotion would come in. I mean, I guess, what, you know, the claim would be emotion is also, is, is uh, you know, emotions are by the very nature highly bodily centered, right? You know, you feel, you know, you suddenly you, you discover you're angry because you have all these bodily, you have all these um, bodily reactions. Uh, so I, I would certainly think of emotion as something very bodily centered. Now, yeah, like I said, this, some of it you can, discuss, you can go back to, um, uh, you can go back to um, Kant um, and other philosophers. I was struck, I found, I did some reading um, 10 years ago maybe in uh, Freud, and although a lot of what he says is baloney, he's really said he was a very, he was a very smart man, no doubt about it. As I mentioned, he was, he, early on he was a neuroscientist. And um, even later on, he made some very trenchant observation. I mean, what happened to him then, he started a church and he became sort of caught up as a leader of this church. And there really wasn't any attempt in, in, in his later life sort of to be a scient scientist in a sense to seriously think about how you can verify or test or falsify any of his ideas. But nonetheless, he was an awful uh, smart man. And so these are different, three different quotes from three different uh, of his writing in different phases. If you read this, what well, part is there left to be played in our scheme by consciousness, which was once so omnipotent and hid all else from view? Only that of a sense organ for the perception of psychical qualities. Perceptual qualities, we would say. Or uh, 15 years later, in psychoanalysis, there's no choice but for us to assert that mental processes are in themselves unconscious. 
and to liken the perception of them by means of consciousness to the perception of the external world by means of sense organs. Or another 10 years later, it dawns upon us like a new discovery that only something which has once been a perception can become conscious, that anything arising from within, so he puts feelings apart, that seeks to become conscious must try to transform itself into external perception. So again, the, the idea that anything that has to be conscious has to map itself onto a perceptual, onto a perceptual uh, qual, uh, qualia. Then there's a, oops, there's a famous book by a, uh, by, um, by um, a famous new American neuroscientist, uh, Lashley, and he was working in the last century at Harvard, I think, and then at Stanford. Um, on, uh, on cortex, and um, at, towards the end he comes to this conclusion. No activity of mind is ever conscious. This sounds like a paradox, but it is nonetheless true. There are order and arrangement, but there's no experience of the creation of that order. I could give no, numberless examples, for there is no exception to the rule. A couple of illustrations should suffice. Look at a complicated scene. It consists of a number of objects standing out against an indistinct background, desk, chairs, faces. Each consists of a number of lesser sensations combined in the object, but there's no experience of putting them together. The objects are immediately present. When we think in words, the thoughts come in grammatical form with subject, verb, object, and modifying clauses falling into place without having the slightest perception of how the sentence structure is produced. Experience clearly gives no clue as to the means by which it is organized. I mean, it's a, it's a, I mean this is a... Um, theme that ran through the lecture that most of what goes on in our head, of course, sort of is submental in the sense that we don't have conscious mental access, we don't have co conscious access to it. Now, there's, a, uh, there's an interesting literature on a small literature um, on, on creativity. For, for the most part, at least the one I, the aspect of literature I know is sort of, um, uh, is, is sort of more or less accounts of what it, what it is to be creative and how could you how could you encourage the creative act, right? And you know, by you know, by think by analogical thinking and things like that. There's a very famous book in this literature written by a, a French mathematician Hadamard, who who worked on ill-posed problems and inverse problems in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. In, in the 20s and 30s, in the 40s during the war and after the war, I think when he was here in the U.S. in Princeton, uh, he wrote a book on uh, creativity and this mathematical mind or something of that nature, where he wrote. Well, he wrote to he had a great extended correspondence with lots of famous scientists and mathematicians um, about uh, the creative act. You know, t they, he asked them to recall how they thought and um, and um, um, how they thought and um, what they thought was the origin of their creativity and what would it take to be creative. And there's a very famous quote from him. So, and Albert Einstein was one of the correspondents, and he uh, he wrote back. So he made this quite famous statement. The words are, this is now Albert Einstein, the words are language, his accent is at least as strong as mine, if I read it on, yeah, the words are language, as they are written or spoken, do not seem to play any role in my mechanisms of thought. The psychical entities which seem to service, service elements in thought are certain signs and more or less clear images which can be voluntarily produced or combined. He was very emphatic that he, when he thought, when he did mathematics, he always thought in terms of, he was a geo, um, um, he was doing geometrical, ma uh, ma he was essentially doing geometry, very visual, you know, the type of mathematics he did, of course, in, in you know, Minkowski spaces and things like that, was this a sort of differential ge geometry, differential topology, and of course that lends itself very well to pictorial representation. And it's also my experience myself, or talking to other mathematicians, that most of them, not all, but most of them, at least claim that they think in images. It's a long quote that goes on. Um, so it's something that you can also introspect. To what extent, when you think, you know, of anything, to what extent, um, and to what extent you think in really abstract quantity qualities. And even when you think about, you know, ch playing chess, which you can think is relatively abstract. Well, the way, you know, if I play chess, how do you see it? mental chess? You know, I certainly have, you know, I have a very vivid view of the board in front of me. You know, I have a very vivid view of the figures. Um, and, and I would claim, certainly this corresponds to my personal experience, that most of what I do when I think about also science, I always think in terms of, vi I mean, of visual quantities. That's something you can all do in your own life to try to introspect. Is it really true that, you, that it's all in terms of sensory uh, qual uh, qualities? 
and quantities, or is there also something more abstract that's not sensory? Now, this brings me to a, to a very related point that if you look at that architecture, that the one that I show you with the very circles and the innermost, um, the world inside, uh, sort of underneath consciousness in this uh, diagram, um, you're really reminded of the idea of the homunculus. Now, the homunculus is an old idea. I think it goes back, into, it goes back to Aristotle when he talks about, um, in his uh, book on, um, one of his book on biology, when he talks about um, developmental biology, I mean, what we call today developmental biology, and the, the you know, homunculus is the idea that inside the egg or inside the sperm, there's a tiny, tiny, tiny man or woman. That's sort of the homunculus. And that expresses itself, you know, um, and this sort of tiny man then develops into full-grown man. That's sort of the idea underlying the homunculus. Um, now, we are, there's a great movie, I don't know whether who, uh, any of you have seen it, by, by um, Woody Allen, everything I always wanted to know about sex, but was afraid to ask. You, have you seen that movie? Yeah. And there's this great scene, this petting scene, you know, with the boy and girl pet in the back, make out in the back of a car. And you have this control room metaphor in that, um, 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 in that movie. So you, you're, you're putting yourself, or the movie maker, Woody Allen, puts, himself, or puts us, the audience, inside of this sort of NASA-like control room. Uh, inside the person's head. Now, we, of course, we all laugh, saying, well, that's, you know, that's just an, an analogy, but it turns out that most of the time when we think it's very difficult, it's very difficult to avoid sort of the fallacy of the homunculus, that we say, well, you know, clearly this, you know, when we talk about um, that, that nuance respond, that, you know, that the brain knows, well, actually, who knows, right? I mean, knowing implies there's a knowing subject, so, of, you know, and there's this entire mode of thinking about the brain that it's difficult to get away where you pause it explicitly, most people, most scientists don't do that, but at least implicitly where you posit something that knows. And so that you can call the, the homunculus. Now, this idea is, of course, routinely ridiculed by everybody. I mean, by everybody who thinks seriously about science. But it's a very power, it's an, very powerful because it's powerful because it's intuitive, so appealing. I and mean, clearly, I have the sense, and I'm sure you also have the sense, there's a person inside you. It's actually Christoph inside my head, and he's situated right, you know, if you ask people where they're situated, you can do these experiments. They almost always, if they have normal vision, they point exactly between here, you know, they sort of, it's roughly between the ears and between the, the uh, you know, at the base of the, no, at the nose between the eyes. That's roughly where I am, and most people will have that. I assume if you are half blind, you, you, you might actually, sh I don't know actually whether if people are half blind, they shift it over or they still see the inside the head. But we all have a feeling that I'm sitting inside my head and I'm looking out and I'm sort of in control of this and I'm making all the decisions, etc. It's a very powerful illusion. So it's probably, I think there's probably more, there's probably more to it than, 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 than the, I mean, like any illusion, there's probably some basis to it. And it may be actually be reflected in a key feature of the, of the brain architecture, the one that we talked about early on. Remember this division of the brain? So this is, um, um, this is, um, so this is a human brain. So here you're looking from top, here medial view, here lateral view. This is, the back, this is the back of the brain here. And this is the, so everything here could be, be in front of the central sulcus here, here, or looking down. So uh, looking down the brain, it's the frontal, it's the fr frontal part of the brain, the frontal lobes. And of course, then they are divided into at least a tripartite decision, uh, sometimes uh, a forced division into motor cortex. So this is the motor strip. This has no layer four from here. If you inject current here, or if you put, for example, uh, one of these magnetic pulses over your head, over the motor strip, sort of you get, you know, twitching depending on, you know, what part of the, so there's a motor map. Uh, the, the famous, there's another use of homunculus it's a term that comes, in this case, from Penfield, the surgeon, because you can draw a homunculus onto here, depending on, you know, that different parts of this motor cortex represent different parts of the body, like, you know, my face, my, 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 my body, my, my fingers, etc. So that's a totally different usage. And, yeah, this is motor cortex, this is premotor cortex, and this is a very large part of the brain, and us is maybe, might be as large as 20% or some 25%, it's called the prefrontal, the prefrontal lobe. So, in, in some sense, you could argue, well, all the sensory processing that we talked about really takes place with possible exception of olfaction, which is funny anyhow, because it doesn't go through the, it doesn't have a main projection for the thalamus, that all the, uh, that all the sensory processing essentially, for the most part, takes place in the back part. This is where visual cortex is. This is where, you know, MT is, posterior parietal cortex, the infratemporal cortex, all the face cells, all that takes place. Same thing for the for tactile processing. Same thing for auditory process, processing, Herschel gyrus, all of that. 
you know, here, all of that takes place in the back part. And you could argue that essentially what's happening, you could think of in one way that this front part is looking at the back part. By looking at, I, I mean that it receives dominant driving input form, that you have a feed-forward connection. Remember, we talked about the different types of um, projection system, feed-forward and feed-backward, depending on a, so a feed-forward um, projection would originate in layer two, or particularly layer three, and then project into layer four of the next area. And, and, um, and a, yeah, you have similar rules for the feedback connections. And the feedforward connection usually has a very powerful, the driving ones. If you look at, for example, feedforward connection from LGN into V1, from V1 into MT, they're very powerful activity in their feedforward connection can always, almost always drive the postsynaptic neurons. So you can think of, well, what happens here, you have projections here, lots of, uh, lots of very specific projections, right? It's not just random, they're very specific, that project from the back of the brain into the front of the brain. And in some sense, I think that you can, you can view that favorably as the, the, you know, there is sort of a homunculus, there is this front part of the brain that observes the rest of the world through its interaction with the back of the brain. In that sense, uh, in that sense, you may have a homunculus who lives somewhere in the confines of prefrontal cortex, of course, prefrontal cortex is a huge area and one we're only now beginning to really explore to, at the detail level that we're exploring the back of the brain. Uh, it's looking at the posterior part of cortex. Uh, it's making decisions, this, this homunculus, or this, this set of, of, of modules, and it's feeding those to the motor stages, either direct, uh, directly through motor cortex or more indirectly through prefrontal, uh, through premotor or prefrontal cortex. Now, the, well, one problem with the homunculus is that, of course, if it's a real homunculus, that's a problem of infinite regress, right? We, you see that in the Woody Allen film, because if there's really a man inside my head, then who is, you know, watching sort of, you know, watching the TV, sc TV screens that make up my, 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 my visual world, then who is, you know, in the Gary Larson's cartoons like that, then who is the man inside the man's head, right? Because clearly you need somebody inside the man's head to, you know, and of course that goes, uh, ad, uh, goes on ad, infin ad infinitum. Now, of course, there's no regress, there's no infinite regress if you assume that this entity, this, this fictitious entity we just call homunculus, but it doesn't have the same property as, 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 all, as, as I have. Clearly, if it has exactly the same property, then you have an infinite regress. But when you say, well, this, this property, for, this, for example, this entity is not conscious, the consciousness happens outside, or happens where the sort of the 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 sensory information is being relayed, is being summarized and relayed to this prefrontal cortex, but it doesn't happen actually inside in the deeper parts of prefrontal cortex where you have all this additional processing. Um, that um, that the, the, uh, uh, then you don't get an infinite regress. For example, if you assume that it only has very limited memory, that you have a special module for for working memory, etc., then you don't get an infinite um, uh, infinite. Re um, and regress if you're assuming that homunculus only does certain things. So in this case, the homunculus, it would be an unconscious homunculus because, as I said, the unconsciousness happens sort of at the outside, and this hum what this homunculus does, it, it, I mean, homunculus is just a convenient fiction that, you know, uh, it's, it's a set of modules that is involved in planning and decision-making in um, initiating um, decisions, and you don't have conscious access to them. And so that's why that's why it would explain why you have, for example, why, why many things in your in your own life you don't have access to them. You only have access to the output of these decisions because they are the ones that are made conscious. But since you don't have access to the inner parts of the homunculus itself, you don't really know why you make these decisions, or you can take a plausible guess at it. Yeah, okay, so, this, so, so I mean, this, of course, we all really, this is a very crude division when I said back and front of the brain. So front of the brain is a huge area, right? The total frontal lobes is, I don't know, like 40% or something of the brain. So it's not going to be, you know, that everything here is sort of, uh, you know, that you have this very clean division. It's going to be even parts, we know, for example, there are parts of the frontal lobe, uh, like uh, frontal eye fields that you can think of almost like a, you know, they're, they're, they're very closely connected to, let's say, area MT. And so it's, uh, so what we really need, and it's only happening right now, people like Carmichael, et cetera, they're now doing a detailed subdivision of prefrontal cortex because you really want to make this much finer. So maybe you could argue, maybe parts of prefrontal cortex, you know, maybe parts of the brain around the uh, posterior, you know, the, um, the interparietal sulcus, maybe they, they're cl more closely related to prefrontal cortex. So it has to be made much more precise. 
This throws some new light on, on certain old problems. As I mentioned, uh, um, creativity, the mo if you read this literature, most of the literature comes to the conclusion that the creative act by itself is largely unconscious. That what happens in creativity, you, you generate enormous amount of, um, you know, when you're thinking about any problem, a scientific problem, mathematical problem, uh, you know, an artistic problem or, you know, a problem in your life or whatever, you, you, what happens, your brain throws up an enormous amount of solution unconsciously and then you have some sort of entity that selects that, you know, so, so there are all sorts of things that are being generated constantly by your brain unconsciously, different possibilities, different solutions. And um, although you can also try to trigger that consciously by sort of, you know, learning how to make analogies, right? You, you know, very often that's what the creative act is, right? You have one situation and then you have a different situation and you somehow manage to, to make an analogy between this and this and so you can see the insight here now applies to over here. So that's something you can do consciously. But for the most part, it's an unconscious activity where you generate, your brain generates enormous amount of, of different solutions and then you have some entity in your brain that subselects them and comes up with saying, oh, this is really the interesting one. And that then, that's the one that sort of suddenly, quote, pops into your head and say, oh, I've got an idea, that's it. That's the idea that's then finally made uh, conscious. And there, there's all this literature on, you know, how to, in, 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 I mean, the best way, as far as I can tell from reading this, how to, uh, particularly Hadamard was really very insightful. Uh, Poincaré also has, uh, has written on this, the famous mathematician, the one who formulated the 23 problems in mathematics in 1900 in Paris. Um, the, um, the, the, the best way to induce creativity is to work very hard on a particular problem, you know, your PhD, for example, or anything, you know, a problem that's at the heart of your PhD thesis, work very hard and then go away and do climbing or, you know, recreation or whatever, do something very different. Because very often what, what happens, you know, then you do, uh, I mean, there are a few very famous examples. Uh, Poincaré, for example, has this famous example where he looks at the problem of Fuchsian equations in which he worked for many, many days and he couldn't solve it. And then he, um, he goes on vacation in the south of France and he, as he's about to enter a tram, he has this very detailed description, as he is about to enter the, the step on the tram, he has this, crit, this crucial insight. Just, he says, totally out of, out of the blue. And that's very often what, um, and what, and what people um, describe, that they, they engage in something very active, they can't find a solution, then they, they sleep or they do something very else, and then suddenly, sort of unbidden, it comes into their mind. Um, but they all emphasize that it's, that it's really it's unconscious, it just happens. I mean, there are certain things you can do to make, it, to make it more likely to occur, but the act itself seems to be largely sort of beyond the confines of consciousness. So again, this, you know, if, you are, if you assume that you have all this part of the brain, this unconscious homunculus, that would sort of uh, be part of that. Of course, it, it still doesn't say anything about the neural correlates, how, you know, how, it, how, how is this actually implemented using neurons. There's also, of course, a problem that uh, we didn't really talk about, but it's quite well known. Um, problem of free will and of authorship now it's called. Right, the fact that, no, that I have the perception that nobody... I mean, I believe, in fact, <laughs> that nobody forced me to raise my hand here. Right? I'm totally my own author in you know, doing this and doing this. Certain things I'm compelled to do, but, but, but many things I claim I'm, 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 I, the conscious me, is, is, uh, is the author in charge of this. And now there's um, lots, of, lots of cases when you can show quite rigorously that that cannot be the whole story, that either that, that is totally illusionary or at least in many cases that's illusionary. The most famous one are by Ben Libet, where he had people uh, sit down and look at a, at a clock, goes around with a point, it goes relatively quickly, and then they were supposed to raise their finger or raise their hand whenever they felt like it. So they were under no compunction to do it any time soon. They just you sit there, whenever you feel like it, you do this. And then people were asked to judge um, when they first felt, where was the pointer on the, on the clock, when they first felt the urge to move. Okay, when they first had the inkling that, okay, now I've made this decision to lift. And, um, uh, and then he, he, looked at, um, he looked at evoked potentials. He did this many times. And he, he took brain potentials, e.g., externally, evoked potentials. And what you see, what you see developing over uh, frontal lobe, if you have electrodes here, you see there's a signal that builds up. It's called, a, 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 it was first discovered in, by Germans, it's called the Bereitschaftspotential, or in English, readiness potential. And you see it builds up, the remarkable thing, it builds up uh, first on both sides and then contralateral. To, so if you, if you move this hand, it builds up at some point on the other side. It's contralateral projection. But the important thing, it builds up before, up to 600 milliseconds before you felt first the urge to move, according to your own judgment on the, on the dial. 
And though it was quite controversial, but in the meantime, I think it's well accepted. People did all sorts of control experiments. It was controversial. How accurate are people are judging? But the basic story stands, even today, 30 years afterwards, that in this, in this uh, freely initiated act, right, where you, you're not triggered by anything, you in itself initiate it, which of course, you know, most things in life aren't like that, but in this case, the perception of initiation, the perception of authorship, comes up, to, let's say, half a second after there's a signal in your brain already that tells me you're going to move your hand. Okay? So clearly in this case, something in your brain decided 500 milliseconds before you were informed about it, the conscious you were informed about it, that you're going to move your hand. Okay? Now, in a sense, as scientists, we have to expect this. And this, is, of course, goes back to Kant, who says we have to think in terms of causality. Right? If it's truly, if you think really, what does it mean to have an act that is truly, um, that has, that's, that's truly free, which means there are no physical preceding causes for it. Right? That's really what it means to be, to have, to have, uh, to, to be truly free. And so, you know, as scientists, we, we, we cannot think how that could be, which of course why, why most scientists don't really believe in free will. So you have this, you have this experimental fact that that okay, you, I feel that I just freely initiated this, but the fact is, 500 milliseconds before, something in my brain. Uh, triggered it. So what, probably what happens here, I mean the simplest and most obvious explanation is that you have some algorithm in your brain, let's say in your frontal part, or maybe this could be in the basal ganglia, that has, you know, makes some decision based on whatever algorithm that, you know, to move your hand now, and that information is then communicated to uh, the part of the brain, or, and then you, the, 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 this part of the brain initiates the movement, but and only later is this information actually conveyed to the part of the brain that's conscious, and so only la later on do you do you, initiate, do you feel that you've initiated this? Now, of course, that, that raises some profound issues, which which uh, we we're not going. I'd like to deal in next when I teach this class again next year, but not to, um, the, uh, this year because it really raises profound issue of personal responsibility, right? And sense of sense of authorship. If you know, I feel that I'm responsible, but it's not really the conscious me, but the unconscious me who does it. That sort of that raises some very heavy duty questions about. Responsibility also in the legal sense, in the ethical sense, in the religious sense. And there's a wonderful, for those of you who are interested, there's a fantastic book that just came out last year by uh, Wegener at um, Harvard, Dan Wegener, called The Illusion of Free Will. It's a very compelling book. It, it, it collects all the evidence from, I mean, it talks about a little bit, but it also talks about the many, many cases when people, um, when you have a dissociation between motor action and volition, so for example, all these um, you know spiritual things where people move, how do you call them, uja boards and all these you know table moving and all these other things, where people claim that you know it's a spirit, it's my gra dad grandmother talking to me. Well, you can c show quite objectively that it's actually they themselves move and draw these things, etc. But they all claim they don't do it. Now, of course, you can all say, well, they're just lying. But I think there's much more to it. I think they really believe that they're not doing it. So you have you know you have cases of of of, um, of unconscious. Um, of unconscious motor output without any, um, without having this um, this uh, this feeling of authorship. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what this sort of research, once it has come to its conclusion, will it could really lead to um, redefining what it means to be a, to be a person. You know, we grow, we've, we've grown up by we, I'm, I, not, I, I not only mean, you know, me and you, but also sort of, you know, here in the world over the last several thousand years, we've grown up with the one picture of, of man and women that we've sort of grown accustomed and cherished to, and that's, you know, present in most of, at the basis of most of our religion and the basis of most of our legal system, but we're not really sure to what extent this picture is going to be sustainable over the next few hundred years once this research has, has, uh, has run its course. Um, I think I, meant, I mentioned this once before. Recently, um, I heard about this um, this next fighter plane they're building uh, at the Skunks Work at McDonnell Douglas, and um, they already now the advanced fighter planes. When you do close combat um, support, you know when you're flying sort of at close to Mach 1, just 100 feet above the ground, so no way does a human have um, the pilot have have enough time to react. So it's all machine. It's all machine done. So you have this joystick. And they still they're giving the pilot the illusion of control, and they think it's important. I, I actually like to find out why they think it's important. But they, what I heard is that they think the designers of the airplane think it's important to give the pilot this illusion of uh, of control. Actually, not actually giving him control, not all the time. You know, when you're flying high up, that's one different thing. But at this close quarters, you 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 don't want to give the person the control. So at least this case, there seems to be a functional reason that 
that that makes it valid for the person to believe that he's in control, although he's, ob he's objectively not in control. So the question is, does that have any implication for some for similar process in our head? Might there also be advantages? And this is what Wegner argues, that to have this um, illusion of control and free will, because it'll enable me to, do out, to go out in the world and do things because I believe they're doable, but, but in fact it might be an illusion, at least in, in a certain number of cases. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess that's less interesting than for us. Usually, I don't, I don't, I don't work at, at, at uh, I don't move around at 9G. I mean, there could be other reasons as well. There could be multiple reasons. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Um, now, how could any of this be tested in the in the in the um, how could any of this be tested a little bit more concretely? I mean, most of what I talk to you about sort of is based on introspection. And introspection, I think, is, is a good source of inspiration for experiments, but of course, it's no substitute for doing reduction science because you know of all the illusions that we know we we we, we suffer from. So um, you can think of what are what are visual thoughts? What are thoughts in the visual domain? Now, one hypothesis is this goes back to a famous theoretician uh, on, in vision called David Marr, who worked at MIT and died in 1981, um, that if you, that, uh, that sort of thoughts in the visual domain would be, well, one set of thoughts in the visual domain would be manipulations that involve the three dimensional nature of, um, um, the three dimensional nature of, um, of objects. So there's, for example, some, some, some famous experiments done by um, done at Stanford by uh, oh, what's this guy, um, who where, 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 um, where you're supposed to take two different objects. These are three-dimensional objects, and you have to say whether they're the same or not. And the objects are sort of complicated, you know, complicated geometrical um, uh, shapes. They all consist of various squares that are that are put together. And when you rotate them, so you can see. So you have an, you have one object here, and you have another object, let's see here. And then you can see if you rotate this, it's actually the same object, you know. Or it might be the mirror image, or it might be a different object. And you have to say, is it the same object or not, depending. Uh, is it the same object or not? And here people clearly found that reaction time correlates very strongly with the angle of rotation. So in other words, if you take two objects that, uh, that are, are the same, but they, you have to, in order to map one onto the other, you have to transform them through, an, uh, through a solid angle, um, then you can plot a very nice re um, relationship, linear relationship more or less, between the angle that the, 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 the angle that um, between the two objects and the reaction time. In other words, if, the, if, the, they are, you know, if they're almost similar, you only have to transform them by 20 degrees. The reaction time is much faster than if they're, you know, if they're, let's say, 180 degrees apart and you have to rotate them to a 180 degrees angle. So this gives rise to the thought, well, actually what you're doing, you're doing this three-dimensional transformation in your head. Trouble is that there's almost no evidence for such neurons. All the evidence we have are for neurons that represent things in a very view-dependent way. And so, so while, while you could argue, okay, the, 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 the human does use a three-dimensional representation, the question is whether it's actually explicit, whether that representation is actually there explicit, whether you're actually doing it in a conscious way or whether you're using two-dimensional neurons or neurons that only encode the two-dimensional view or the view um, uh, and the two-dimensional view and not, not use a three-dimensional view. And this is a question that can be tested. So, for example, here you have, people have uh, looked for this is face cells. We talked about them before in one of the classes. This is a guy called Dave Parrott in um, Scotland, St. Andrews. And he's found many cells, and other people also, many cells. So this is in part of the superior temporal sulcus, close to the infratemporal cortex in the, in the ventral vision for perception pathway. And here you have a typical cell. This is a, a, a person. You rotate the person at different degrees, or a model of a person. And you can see this cell. This is what is this, 50 hertz. This cell optimally responds to this particular uh, person viewed this sort of sideways. Here you have another cell. This cell responds um, you know, for the left profile or the right profile. You find this very often. In fact, very often these are, these are 180 degrees apart from each other. You see this. I think I showed one of two of these cells before. 
So the, the majority, so here in one study, this is just typical, 144 out of 150 cells, so like, uh, you know, 94% of the cells or so were of this ilk. In other words, they represented the object, but they represented it in a very view-dependent way. In a very view-dependent way. So they only recognize it from one angle or from a different angle. Now this, and this, to a certain extent, reflects the character of our scene, because when we see something, we don't have sort of a CAD CAM, you know, like a, like a computer design um, model, three-dimensional model in our head that we can sort of immediately visualize it from all different angles. When I look at somebody, I see this person from one particular view, from one particular angle. However, he does, he does note in his paper, he's sort of a little aside, and he has this one figure, where it's very rare, in this case only 6 out of 150 cells, that there are a small number of cells that do actually form uh, a view independent. So this cell responds selectively to this phase. It doesn't respond to a bunch of other phases. Uh, roughly always at 40 hertz. You know, what is it? 35, 40 hertz. Pretty much independent of the view. And then remember we talked about paperclip cells. So this is by a uh, uh, logotitis. So here you find something similar. So these are cells that where the monkey was trained over many months to recognize one paperclip. So you take a bent paperclip and the monkey views it from different angles and it has to distinguish it from 50 other bent paper clips that to you and me look virtually identical. It's a very difficult task. They use paper clips because they want to make sure it's something that the monkey isn't at all familiar with. And like, we can also do it, but it also requires us training. So then uh, what surprised people at the time that you would find these highly, highly specific cells. So here you have a cell that responds to one, just one paper clip, either this angle or the angle 180 degrees from it. So again, you can see this very often when you get these mirror symmetry. This, these things at 180 degrees apart. Here it shows you 60 other paper clips. So here the best response can be like 60 hertz of, you know, 50 hertz in this case. Here these are other paper clips. The best, the best distractor paper clip fires only at 5, the cell will only fire at 5 hertz. So it clearly vastly prefers this paper clip. Or oh, here's another one. Now here they recorded from 700 cells. And like, I don't know, 750 of these cells or 740 of these cells were always of this view, that if the cell was selected, it was al almost always selective to one particular view. And that, again, corresponds to what, what the experience is, of course, of, of, of the monkey looking at, a, looking at a particular paper clip, since you don't see the paper clip instantaneously in all three dimensions. Here's another cell. However, good and tight. 8 out of 773 cells were of this ilk. So again, a very small minority in this part of the brain were of this ilk, where they responded, uh, sorry, this is a behavior, this is where the cell fired roughly at 40 hertz to this particular paper clip, independent of its, independent of its, uh, of its angle. And this is a response to other, dis, uh, other very similar looking paper clips that to you and me would look the same, but the monkey can discriminate them. So even the best distractor, the cell only fires at 10 hertz, while here, you know, it always fires between 30 and 40 hertz. So, uh, so the, the, the claim is that the vast majority of cells that you, that you see that encode visual objects in 3D encode them in a, as seen from one particular angle or another angle. And, um, for the most part, I would suspect those are some of the subset of these neurons are going to be the ones that, that, that generate the conscious perception. However, there are also these cells here, a very small set of cells here and in the previous study that seem to encode uh, neurons in a view invariant way. Now, it may well be possible, this is not the only part in the brain where you have these very specific face cells. There's also a frontal part of the brain that Goldman Rakish discovered and described around the central, the principal sulcus, where you have many neurons that also encode face and face identity. And uh, it's quite, it's quite po I mean, people just don't know. One possibility is that there you have many more of these neurons that, code, that, encode, new, that encode the stimulus in a view independent, in a view independent manner. And the question is, so this is something you can then test, is it true that, that all those neurons that, 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 um, that, that the neurons that encode the object in a view independent, in a view independent way, that those are never the neurons that, you, that give rise to consciousness because they would sort of be the correlates of, of visual thoughts on the argument that this view independent way corresponds sort of to something that, uh, that, you don't, that, that might be important in visual transformations that, that the brain can do effortlessly, but it's not, it does not correspond to the character actually of seeing. When you're seeing something, you're always, when you're thinking about something, you're always seeing it or visualizing it from a particular angle. You can then rotate it in your head, but you always view it, that takes time and effort, you always view it from a particular angle. And therefore here the prediction would be that all that these neurons and 
wherever else these neurons are formed that they are view independent that they do not co that their activity does not by itself give rise to conscious sensation because they don't form part of the MCC. Okay, let me summarize. Let me try to summarize what we. Are there questions? Do you have any questions about anything we talked about today? No? It can't all be perfectly clear. Come on. Yeah, yes, yes. No, no, the claim is, so, so A, this is exactly what the, so the monkey did, they did the following experiment. I don't have a paper clip, but they, if they showed it only, uh, oh, here's a paper clip. So. No, 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 no. The monkey was, uh, was given this, but the first the monkey was only shown it from this angle, yeah. only this angle. And then they, uh, they asked, well, how, okay, it can recognize this now very well. You know, you train it for a week, and it can detect this and distinguish it from similar-looking paper clips. But then you ask it, how well can I generalize? So now if I show it this, or I show it this, or I show it this. So you can show there's a sharp drop-off. As you change the angle, it, its performance becomes dramatically worse. Now, so now what you have to do, you have to train it. You show this, you show this, you show this, you show this. And then the monkey gets this performance where essentially you can now recognize it from any angle. That takes time. That's exactly what, what, what you're going through. Right, but, but not just recognition. It's, it should be able to, um, when, when there is no big structure happening, it should be able to recognize it from anywhere. You should be able to see the head and turn it in your head and put it on paper again. Yes. Whatever angle you want. Yes, and clearly you, and clearly you can do that. So the question is, the question is, and I don't know right now how to do that at a psychophysical level. I only knew how to do that at the neuron level. When you're when you're doing this in your head, so let's say you're taking this the model, you know, the, yeah. let's say you have a model and you're painting, you're drawing her, you're you're uh, sketching her, and you're closing your eyes and you're turning her in your head. Then um, what are you conscious of? Are you are you actually conscious of the three-dimensional head? I don't think so. I mean, I, I think what you're conscious of, you're conscious, okay, now I'm looking at her from the side, now I'm looking at her from the back, now I'm looking really from the back, now I'm going around. So I think what you're conscious of is a discrete snap, it's a sort of snapshot of different views. You're actually not conscious of what, you know, in a computer CAD CAM system, you know, where, where you can immediately see it from all sides. I, I mean, that's, that's a supposition. It might be wrong, but that's a supposition. No, the angle, I mean, I don't know what the monkey knows about angles or rotation. The monkey just gets juice when he, when he distinguishes this. No, I mean, the, I mean, that's what it comes down to. So it, 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 it learns to recognize this particular object. But it does seem that it's learning to recognize maybe the concept that the, the object can be turned. I don't know, and I, 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 I mean, that would be a very different experiment. You could, I guess you could test that. I, don't, I mean, they didn't test that. In this case, they tested to what extent does the monkey learn to recognize this particular paper clip. I mean, the, the monkey clearly knows from its own experience manipulating, I mean, it, at least know implicitly from its own experience manipulating, you know, they constantly do stuff, you know, they, they like the manual, right, they do stuff. In fact, they're not very careful, they try, you know, they always fiddle around with the lock, they try to get out of there. Um, so, you know, clearly they know, you know, they know the concept of, um, of manipulating objects and rotating and looking at it from other sides. Okay, so... Uh, so I, I, I hope, so I mean, what, what I hope to have given you in this lecture is, is a falling over the last 18 classes, is, is um, an appreciation for the fact that, that uh, what we think of sort of is very obvious um, uh, is actually not at all obvious. And there are all these modules in our head, there are all these complicated modules um, in different brain areas, different sectors of the brain that do very sophisticated things that are beyond the pale of consciousness. And that what we think of simple and effortless is actually a huge amount of, of sort of highly specialized machinery dedicated that subserves that. And then I just want to transmit you a, you know, a number of specific facts about the brain. And then also lastly, some specific idea that, 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 that Crick and I have uh, I've had, which may or may not be right. 
But just to summarize some of them ideas, so one of the ideas I just talked about today, the, the idea that there's a part of the brain, in particular in the front part of the brain, that in some sense can be said to sort of take, to analyze the sensory information and process it, and that by itself is not conscious. And you can think of that like an unconscious homunculus, and that part of the functionality of that, of that, anti, of that homunculus is to do things like decision making. Um, and that would, one of the implications here is that you're not conscious of your, that consciousness in the processing, in the computational scheme, resides somewhere uh, between the input and the out, uh, between sort of the innermost stages and the outermost stages. It's not the highest stage in terms of information processing machinery. Uh, that there are highly trained sensory motor actions. I think this is really quite beyond um, in dispute everybody that there is a, that our daily action is a significant part of our daily life as we get older I think it takes up a larger and larger fraction of our life is, is, by, is, is carried out by these very highly trained sensory motor actors I call them zombies that bypass consciousness this of course gives rise to the question why do you need consciousness at all I think you need it because for all those things where you don't need where these sens highly trained sensory motor systems aren't good enough uh, and then it's a purely hypothesis, although most people have this, that the, the, at the neuronal level, that a lot of these feed-forward systems, because they're very fast and they're being trained, that's why you train them to be very fast and effortlessly, can go on without, without any substantial feedback in terms of cortical-cortical feedback loop. And that NCC, one of its requirements is really that you, requ that you require some, very sp some feedback from higher areas feeding back down to intermediate areas, which is one reason why it takes longer to, in order for you to be conscious of something. That the right way to think about the brain is really in terms of coalition that you have, that for any given percept or thought, uh, any given percept or action or memory, you have a coalition of neurons that represents that. And that these coalitions are very, very dynamic. They form and reform and coalesce and, and form new coalition and are suppressed at the time scale of a fraction of a second. Um, so, I mean, faster than, 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 um, well, um, I don't know, faster, maybe at the speed of, I mean, literally at the speed of thought, quote, I mean, on the order of a fraction of a second. Uh, we don't know how large these are. We don't know, I mean, in order for you to have any specific percept, most people think you need, you know, a gazillion of neurons, you know, billions of neurons. I think it might be, we just don't know, you know, if the right concept is present, it might be a very small number, number let's say 10 to the 3 neurons rather than 10 to the 6 neurons. Um, yeah, and, and conversely, that there can be large, there, that, that certainly attention and consciousness, because you're usually only conscious of one or very few things at a given point in time, one or two or three things, that you really have, at least at the levels of representation where consciousness is, which is sort of the intermediate levels, you have, you have a very strong competition for, you cannot have more than a small number of, of, um, of coalitions um, that, are success, that are active at the same time. They, they're sort of suppressing, they're suppressing each other. And of course, you can, t you can see that very well if you look at these illusions like change blindness, um, particularly like binocular rivalry and the other bistable percepts where you never see the two percepts at once, but you only, you only sort of see one or the other always moving in this endless dance back and forth. I mentioned that what is really crucial, this is a hypothesis of Francis Crick and myself, that you have an explicit representation in the brain, that, that, that um, if you represent information implicitly, like in the posterior parietal cortex, the, um, or like in the retina, that that information might be there. I mean, everything I see about the world, everything I know about the world is, sorry, everything I see about the world is present already in the photoreceptors, right? There's no new visual information that's being added. There's maybe a priori information in my brain, but there's no new information that's being added. But it's all spread out in a very implicit way. Right? It's very, it's, you're going to have, if you have this idea of depth of computation, logical depth of computation, if you need an algorithm to read out my photoreceptor in order to say whether there's a face present, that algorithm has to do many more computations than if you sit in, in you know, infratemporal cortex where you know, one of the monkey cells is, that, monkey, that one cell or maybe 10 of its bodies by itself can tell you whether or not a face is present. So that's an explicit representation. And since, since consciousness is direct, right, when I see something, I, I, I see it as a face, or I see, you know, unless I have prosopagnosia, then I don't. But if I see it, I can see it directly as a face, and therefore there has to be an explicit representation for that face, since there's nothing else in the brain. It's only neurons. Yeah, I briefly mentioned this, that probably in this processing, in, this, in, the, in the hierarchy, as you have this input, this net wave, I call it, that moves from the retina through the LGN into V1, into V2 and IT, you know, um, that, that uh, and then sort of in terms of what happens consciousness, I think you have to have close this loop, you have to have this feedback, 
and that's where the higher stages uh, probably act. Uh, this feedback first connects with the higher stages, and you're first conscious of things at the higher level, things like for example faces or things like a gist. Right, I mentioned you're very, very, um, as far as we can tell, you only need 30 or 50 milliseconds exposure time, and then you can mask an image, but you already have access to gist, in other words, to the high-level description of, of, of the, the high-level conscious description of the object, of the scene you're seeing. That one has to really, it's critical, and it's going to be much more sophisticated in the fullness of time. It's going to be like chemistry, you know, where you have ionic bonds and covalent bonds and van der Waals bonds. You know, you've also, you just don't, it's not just two atoms stick together, right? There are very different ways they can stick together. And so likewise, in the brain, we have to think of very different types of connection. At the very, very least, we have to think of driving connection and modulatory connections. The driving connection, like the feed-forward connection from V1 into V2 into V4, etc., and then, um, connection that sort of feed, like feedback that modulate that. I, I mentioned this, we really didn't talk more about it. Oliver Sacks is going to come out with a nice piece on this um, in, um, I think, the New York Book Reviews or the New York, I don't know, uh, uh, one of these, where he actually describes patients, he, he just sent this to me, that's why I know about it, where Sacks described these patients that come out of, that either have um, LSD and on a, on a uh, uh, sort of recovering from an LSD delirium or um, from some other disease where they can see, he calls it cinematographic vision, where they see things like it's slowed down. Like really, it's like you're seeing a movie, but the movie is played at two or three uh, frames a second. So apparently they, they don't see things uh, continuously, but they see things like frozen, really like frames, exactly like, like Rick and I proposed in terms of snapshots. That, right, so. I mean, Crick and I propose the possibility that, and this is an old, I mean, many people have said this, that the evolution of the networks in the brain is, of course, continuous. In fact, you have this continuous evolution of fine grades and voltages, etc. But that the character of perception is more discrete, that you see something that it's really like frames, it's really a bit like a movie, that you have these frames, and a frame includes, let's say, you know, a description of motion, where sort of motion is painted onto that frame, and sort of for whatever the duration of the frame is, that's probably very flexible since we know there's no central clock-like um, um, organization present. It might be 30 milliseconds, it might be 100 milliseconds, where for that time sort of you, 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 you see something with color and with motion and everything, but it's, 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 if you look at it, it actually would be static. And then you see, um, you see another sort of discrete snap, uh, sh snapshot. And Oliver Sacks describes this patient where that might actually be the case, uh, where it slowed down so much that you can directly um, visualize it. I'm almost done. And then we talked about attention and binding. The fact, the remarkable fact, the commonplace, but uh, nonetheless remarkable fact that of all the things that come into, the, into my sensorium, I'm only conscious of a very small sub subset of them. I'm only conscious of the things I tend to. I showed you all sorts of visual illusions, right? Uh, the, the gorilla in our midst and all sorts of other ones, change blindness, etc., where large things can happen, where things can take many seconds to cross the screen, but you're totally, but you just don't see them. Uh, and, uh, you know, the obvious reason, one obvious reason is, of course, to, uh, in order to enable me to perform things in real time, I have to sub-select all the information that I can deal with. There might be other reasons re relating to, uh, to, le to learning. Um, that there, uh, of the select, attentional selection strategies, there are probably at least two broad ones. One is bottom-up. So, in other words, one is inherent in the input itself. If somebody jumps up and down, he's for sure going to get my attention. If something is very red among green background, et cetera, et cetera. So, that's bottom-up saliency. But, of, of course, I also have a second mechanism, albeit a slower one, that selects things based on a template. You know, I'm looking for somebody. I'm looking for something. I have a, you know, I'm, I'm searching for something particular, and I can, I can, I can, um, I can tune my, 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 um, my processing errors to look for something special, like something moving to the right or something red. And then ultimately, at the neuronal level, I think attention sort of is all about uh, competition among, new, among these neuronal uh, these coalitions, and attention biases one of the other coalitions. So if you have a competition and you attend to one, you're going to bias that and you're going to suppress the other one. You're, you will not be conscious of the associated percept, the associated uh, object. And then I mentioned this a, a number of times. The, right now, the evidence is still sort of is, is up in the air that, that there are different types. I mean. What, what we do know in the brain, that the different types of firing, so there's sort of firing where you just have a random process, a Poisson process, then sometimes you get firing that's sort of an, of an oscillatory nature at different frequencies like 6 hertz or 40 hertz, 
and uh, people right now don't really know what to make of it. I just talked with somebody a couple of days ago, and he said, yeah, sure, in his part of the brain, there are lots of cells that have a theta rhythm at 6 hertz. He has no idea why they do it, but they, but they do it. And then a, a number of people have postulated some of the best work is here done by Laurent, G. Laurent Caltech, where you have, um, when neurons fire in a synchronized, where you have two sets of neurons that seem to fire much more together than they should based on chance, where it's possible that, that, uh, that the synchronization by itself actually expresses a, um, a relevant fact. This might be one way how the brain can buy signals by enabling them to fire together because then they pack a more powerful punch. If neurons are synchronized, they are more effective at, at sort of at evoking, at evoking a response in the next stage. Now, one last thing we haven't really dealt with, uh, which is um, it's difficult at this stage of the game, of the scientific game, to deal with co uh, cohesively, but it's, it's a problem of meaning. It's another, it's another one of these deep problems. That, that I mentioned this at the very first in the class, that, of course, different from a computer system, different from symbols on a computer, let's say an on and off state on a transistor gate, the symbols in my head have meaning. They're profoundly meaningful. You know, even as simple as the color blue has also has an entire rush of, of meaning, right? The blue, you know, I just drove, I came back from Zion National Park last, the weekend and I drove by in Las Vegas and they have this, what's it called, blue man group, right? Mm -hmm. You know, blue, the ocean, blue, I mean, all sorts of things, Van Gogh, blue, I mean, they're all sorts, there's an entire rush for, even simple things as color, they have association. Of course, you know, a face or a picture or scene have a vast sea, a web of associations. Um, and uh, these are grounded in our experience. They're, they're, they're not arbitrary. So again, very different from a computer. They're highly structured, they're not arbitrary, they're grounded in our experience. There are various sources of these uh, meaning. One is innate. It's, I, I suspect that the simplest meanings are innate. You know, when you're born already, we know even in an infant that's two days old, uh, two hours old, the infant will already sort of smile at the T-scheme. You know, the infant will already smile at something that looks like a human face. We, I mean, we know that empirically. So there you can argue, you know, it's extremely unlikely you learned it over those two hours. It's probably innate. Likewise, you know, you know, looking for the, 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 in the mother's breast is, you know, and, you know, suckling or, or a pain, I suspect those are all sort of innate, but then, of course, they get refined. Then there are the other sources are sort of the, the you can see that again with, with young children, how they sort of, you know, exercise, how they look at their, their fingers or they look at their, their thumbs, you know, you can sort of see that with my kids when they're lying in the crib and they're sort of playing with their, their thumbs as if they're really, you know, playfully, Doing, you know, they're saying, okay, let's see what happens if I move that line, and now let's see what happens if I move that line. And you know, of course, they don't do it in a, in a conscious sense; they do it unconsciously. But nevertheless, you build up all these expectations. You build up this expectation that when I move my hand in this way, that you know, I get this certain sensation, and it moves on my retina. And if I don't have this anymore, I have big, big difficulty. So there's this very compelling book, a, a case story called um, *Pride in the Daily Marathon*. Very compelling book by somebody called um, Cole. It's a very scary experience. This is a guy, 19 years old, in, in England. He wakes up one day and gets a flu infection. Okay, a few days later, he's paralyzed. Or it turned, or, and he remains, well, he's paralyzed. It turns out what happens, and then he recovers, but not completely, unfortunately. It turns out that the, the, um, uh, uh, this virus has knocked out all the proprioceptive feedback from his body below the neck. So he's, uh, permanently, he's lost them for good. So he's no way, he has no way to feel thing anymore. So he has none of these, these signals that are always present, you know, when I move my hand, he doesn't have any of that. So in terms, uh, he, he thought he was paralyzed, in fact he was not paralyzed, his motor system was fine, he just had no sensa body sensation anymore. The only thing he had left uh, below his neck was a sense of, of temperature. So he could get deep pain, not a superficial pain, but deep pain and, and, and temperature sensitivity. All the other uh, sensory input from his body joint was knocked out. So um, th there, by the way, is another case story how utterly important all these unconscious uh, you know, sensory motor systems are so, because for the next half year he was a, a, literally a heap of bones and muscles. Well, a, he had a huge reactive depression, as you can imagine, you know, 19-year-old guy. You know, his life has changed for good for the rest of his life. Uh, but then eventually he recovered, he pulled out, and I think he even married, and he learned incredibly painfully with an, you know, sort of superhuman endurance, he learned to control all of his muscle willfully by, by looking at them. Because, you know, for, for me, you know, I just, you know, you do, we don't think about it, you just reach out and do this, right, just without thought. Well, he couldn't do that anymore because he had no feedback anymore. So he had to look at that and, and painfully sort of learn which muscle to move. 
And of course, at first he got everything wrong, and still, you know, if people come up to him and hit him on the back, he falls over flat, right? Because he's, he's, uh, you know, the only way he can walk, um, sort of, is, is by looking at his, at his body. And you know, compelling book. Uh, of course, we also learn by taking it, uh, information across modalities, right? By confirming things, you know, I can smell things, I can hear things, I can touch things, you know, I can see things. Well, how do they look? And then I have some expectation, I can pick them up, and I can see are my expectations met. And of course, we also, for us, this is terribly important. Another sort of meaning is abstract semantic associations, right? I know pi 3.1415927, etc. I know, you know, Brutus gave the last, you know, stab to kill um, the mortal blow to Julius Caesar, etc. Now the question is. Meanings are incredibly important for us. A, the question is why do we need this meaning, and B, how is it implemented neuronally? Because, I mean, this has to be explained. Um, of course, it has to be somewhere in the synaptic connection. It has to be in the connections that, that, that sort of, you know, if you, have a, if you have a bunch of neurons, let's say those Clinton neurons. Remember, I showed you the neurons that Gabriel Kahneman recorded in the human patient response to highly selective to Clinton. Well, I, you know, the it's and its bodies codes for the, pre well, I don't know what it codes for, maybe for the presidency, maybe, maybe for Bill Clinton, maybe for the White House. Who knows? But all those associations with Clinton, they have to come sort of, they have to be associated with that coalition of neurons that represents Clinton. So some of it, of course, is not even conscious, right? You, you, you have this rush of, uh, rush of association, but then you actually have to think about it. Wait, what does this remind you of? And only then does it pop into your mind. So all these associations are probably not directly part of the NCC because you're not directly conscious of them, because you couldn't be conscious of all those things at the same time, but they have to be very close to the NCC because you, because you do have this feeling, this rich feeling that you have all these, this meaning is just there below the surface. So in fact, you could argue that one function of, 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 of consciousness of quality is to summarize all the, you have this vast amount of information, right? So about numbers and about, you know, anything. You have this vast amount of information, but you don't have it read, you, you know, you cannot possibly have all of that accessible at the same time because of the, the well-known limitations, you know, that you get in attention. That's why you need attention. And so therefore, this qualia might be a convenient way uh, to summarize all of that. So instead of having all this association, you have the qualia for it. <clears throat> so this is the last slide of the course. And this, unfortunately, I don't have an answer to. And it's really too bad because that's the most central question. But I promised you I didn't have an answer to that. So I, I think I was being very honest. All right, so why does it feel like anything? Why does it feel like anything? I think I know why it's private, you know, because it's ultimately it's my representation in my head, which are slightly different from the representations you had. You can sort of understand why red is different from blue. They have different wavelengths, they have different properties, they have different association. But what's really sort of at this point impossible to understand, which is why Chalmers calls it the hard problem, is why does it feel like anything? And there's a wonderful quote. I mean, one of the best modern books of philosophy, although it doesn't really, well, I'm not sure how much it teaches you, but it's very heroic to read. It's the... Um, the, the one that he wrote in the prison of war camp, well, while it was on the western front fighting Russia, and then in the prison of war camp, but Ludwig Wittgenstein, the young Ludwig Wittgenstein, the heroic one, when, you know, when he gave up all of his riches, etc., uh, uh, Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. He wrote this when he was like 26, and he, um, you know, it starts, it, is, it has a numbering system, it starts one, the world is everything that is the case. And then he has one of his wonderful sentences in there, Nicht wie die Welt ist, ist das Mystische, sondern das sie ist. Which means something like, not, not how the world is, is, is mystical. That's sort of scientific, but why the world is. And the same thing with consciousness. So we can understand that, that, that how, how, how is the world perceived differently, that has to do with neurons and the relationship, etc. But that, that you can perceive anything at all, that's really the, 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 the mystery right now. And um, I don't have a solution. I really don't know anybody else who has a solution right now. Like I said, some people re respond to this by saying, well, it's just an illusion, it doesn't actually exist. Maybe they're true, but it's so compelling that I, I want more than just a philosophical assertion. So I leave you with the thought, that not how the world is as mystical, than that the world is. And maybe, and I hope some of you will go out and do neuroscience and help solve this problem that's bugged us at least since 2,500 years. <laughs> at least. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope you liked it.